grace may abound, by no means. How can we who die to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The next scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 to 33. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetop. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are more valued than many sparrows. Everyone therefore acknowledges me before others. I also will acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Removes the 
unrestrained growth of the power of sin in our lives. I've heard it say, said before that justification is, is just like saying just as if it never happened. What has happened has been taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then sanctification is our living like what is said about us is actually real in our lives. The Apostle Paul introduces God's threefold method of leading to sanctification because that's really the idea in these chapters that, that you're looking at here in the book of Romans. And he said there are three steps. The first step you find in this passage of scripture that was read this morning. And, and the, the word that would describe that would be the word no, K-N-O-W. Believers must be aware of these three facts. Verses 1 through 3 she read that we have been crucified with Christ. Paul reiterates that over in uh, the book of Colossians, the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 he says that you know we've been crucified with Christ nevertheless we live and yet not I but Christ which lives now within us and the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who died and gave himself for us. The second truth is in verse 4 and 5. They have, we have been resurrected with Christ. That is, Christ has said, the Word of God um, stands for the approval that these things are facts about our lives that have taken place already. We have been crucified with Christ, and the Scripture says here in these verses that was read this morning, we have been resurrected with Christ. And then verses 6 through 10, we find that we as believers are now both dead and alive. We are dead to sin, but alive in Christ. Dead to sin and alive in Christ. Now, the second step, which is the reckoning factor, and really verses 12 through 23, the end of the chapter, are the ones that I really want to focus. The word reckon means to count on. It means something has happened, that's a fact, that's it. <coughs> nothing, we, nothing you can do can change what has already happened. Paul described two kinds, two kinds of yield. The wrong kind, verses 12 and 13, that is that we are not to yield, therefore, the members of our body any longer as tools of wickedness to the old way of life. And then there's the second the right kind in verses 13, the last part of 13 through verse 23. We find several things. First of all, verse 15, we find that there is the confusion. The Bible says, since God's grace has set us free from the law, um, it does not mean that, that we should no longer we should no longer go on sinning. The idea is, well, if grace has come, should I keep on sinning so that I have more grace in my life? And the answer is, certainly Paul says, no, that's not what we should So, And then the correction of verse, uh, verses 15 through verse 18, the answer is, I just told you, of course not. The challenge is in verse 13, the latter part, through verse 14, and then the lengthy part, verses 19 through 22. We are to yield the members of our body as tools of righteousness for His name's sake. And then there's the conclusion, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God's salvation is in Jesus Christ. That is uh, our, our Lord and our Savior. It's the gift of God. It can't be paid for. Uh, we cannot earn it. This gift cannot be purchased by um, the recipient. So I'm going to go back here at this particular point, and I want to share to you with you some things out of the book of Romans that I think are, are very interesting. They help us understand even clearer what's being said in Romans chapter 6. Basically, let the Word of God say and defend itself. Chapter 4, the idea is focused on Abraham because the Jewish people like to say that we are who we are because a promise had been made to Abraham. And 
Paul clarifies what's being said in verse 1. What then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, did, uh, discovered it in this manner? It is a fact that Abraham was justified uh, by works. He had something to boast of, but not before God. What does the scripture say? The scripture says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Down in verse number seven. Blessed are whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. These are the facts. These are what we ought to be reckoning on. This is what God has done for humanity because of his love. He shows his great forgiveness for us and for all who have gone before us. Then over in, in, in chapter 4, at the end of her chapter, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word is in that it was credited to him were written not for alone, but for all of us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who, being, who believe in him, who raised Jesus from the dead, from Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Then he continues in chapter 5, the continuing word here is therefore. Anytime you see in Paul's writing, especially in the book of Romans, a therefore, you need to discover what the therefore is there for. And you have to go back a little bit. I just did that by telling you what he was talking about, what the point was in chapter 4. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, it is not by works that any of us have done, nor could we ever do enough good things that would bear God's favor. We are one with Christ because of what Jesus Christ has done once for all. He's the propitiation for sin. We have peace with God for our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That would be you and I. But God demonstrates, verse 8, His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse number 10. For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him, through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Verse 12, under the therefore. Therefore, just as sin entered into the world through man, so he was talking about Abraham, now he's going back even further and talking about Adam. For since through one man, death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men, because all have sin. Then verse 17 of chapter 5, he says this, For if by the trespass of one man, that is Adam, death reigned through, uh, through this one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, that is, through Jesus Christ, the gift of Righteousness reigned in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one man, one act of righteousness was justification and bring life to all men. That is through Jesus Christ. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, that many were made righteous. My righteousness, the Bible tells me, is as filthy bad. 
not anything I can do that can please God. This body, all it knows to do is please itself. But the Spirit of God that lives within me is working to please itself. The Bible, Paul tells us uh, later on in the book of Romans, and he tells us again over the book of Galatians, listen, there's this great war going on in our lives to do right, and then there's a pulling of doing wrong. I can either please the Spirit of God or please myself and continue in my sinfulness. Verse 5, uh, verse, see the verse 5, says that if we have been united with Him like this in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. He's telling us what I've already told you. We have been one by the crucifixion, and we are one because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are one. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Verse 9, For if we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. What He has done for us has already taken place. It's not going to happen. Died once for the past, for the present during his time, and for the future which is going on right now in our lives. We have been made one by the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. In the same way, verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as to those who have been brought, uh, who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your life, your body, uh, to Him as instruments of righteousness. Our righteousness, his righteousness, for sin shall not be your master. And that moves us into this interesting part here uh, near the end. So we find here what we need to do is accept what has been done, live our lives with gratitude, thanking God for what he has done on our behalf for us. Verse 12, 23, actually, actually this, this verse, um, the word for wages, it refers to, um, it refers to pocket money in, in the Greek, pocket money that was allowed to a slave. A slave was given this to help him move on. We have been given Jesus Christ so that we as slaves to righteousness might move on. Death is not the only final rest and result of sin, but it's the present result of sin. Eternal life is a grace for us. It is a grace given, a gift given to you and I. So being a Christian is not a matter, is a matter of life and death. The first 11 verses tells us that. And being a Christian is also a matter of bondage or freedom. We do not have to remain slaves to sin because we have been set free and we need to live in the freedom of what Christ has done. So let me ask you a question. Who is the master of your life? Is it Jesus Christ and what he has done? Or is it himself trying to make God happy for God to be pleased with? Remind, remember, folks, there is nothing that you and I will ever do that's going to catch God by surprise. He already knows past, present, and future. We're never going to surprise God. We're never going to just jump up and say, we're going to do this, and God will be happy with us. God already sees it all, because everything is always in the presence of God. Always in the presence of God. So who's your master? We're not under the authority of Moses, verse 15 tells us. That doesn't mean that we have freedom to break any of God's moral laws, his moral standard for us. 
We yield to the Lord, as the scripture says, we have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been paid in full. He has redeemed us again to himself. Regardless of what we were, we have been set free. That is a position already taken place. And you and I, we are working out our salvation in fear and trembling as we live this life. You know, the word death, verse 23, tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through the Son of Jesus Christ. This word death um, is, is distinct. It's distinct in its manifestations in biblical terminology. We can go all the way back to Adam and Eve when God said, don't do this if you do you will die. Up to that point, nothing has died. Because death is a result of sin. But they broke God's word. They disobeyed God's law when he said, don't do it. And they were, the first thing, spiritual death. They were separated from God. Paul elaborates more of this over in the book of Ephesians in the first chapter. But there's also physical death physical death. When Adam and Eve did what they did, they were spiritually dead. Their eyes were open. They physically now were going to die a physical death. But there was also eternal death. Or other passages of Scripture talking about it as the second death, which includes not only eternal separation from God, but eternal torment in the lake of fire that's mentioned over in the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter. When sin entered the human race through Adam, we just read about all these aspects of death came with him. Adam wasn't originally subject to death, but because of sin, that is, disobeying what God said to do, Death became this grim certainty for humanity. You know, the death referred to in Romans 6, 23, it includes the first one, separation, literally, and it includes the last description, which is eternal uh, separation from God. But verse 23, it establishes two absolutes. No, we live in a world where there are no absolutes, but the Word of God is clear that there are absolutes. And here are two of them. Spiritual death and eternal separation from God, they make up, as Paul talks about, the paycheck for every person, uh, every person who uh, is a slave to sin without Christ. Spiritual death and eternal separation. Why do we need to have a change in our life? Why do we need to accept what Jesus Christ has done? Jesus who led the Father in heaven. Jesus who was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Who would come, who would give his life, and his blood would cleanse us from all sin, past, present, and future. Even those three days that he was in the ground, in hell, testifying who he was before all those individuals. But listen, folks, spiritual death is a certain. We are all going to physically die. And when we physically die, what we have done with Jesus Christ here determines and echoes what will take place in all eternity. And the second absolute here is that eternal life, it is a free gift that God gives. That's what Romans, uh, Romans 6.23 says. The wages, the paycheck for sin is death. Spiritual separation. Eternal separation. But the gift of God is eternal life through the Son, Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus Christ alone. Through what Jesus Christ has done, proving that he was God's Son. Giving his life on the cross, shedding his blood, the third day rising from the grave.
And then now seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for you and I, and preparing a place for you and I as his children. That is an absolute. Those are truths. They are real. Ephesians chapter 2 talks more about that whole idea. So how does a person get to heaven? If he doesn't get to heaven by trying to, what we learned from the children of Israel, they were given these laws by God to govern them, to lead them, not, not to be a tyrant to them, but really for the purpose of protecting them as they lived, as they journeyed, and gave them some light as they went along the way. You and I don't live by a bunch of laws. We live under God's grace. But if God has done it, that we can never do for ourselves. The Bible the Scripture tells us that, listen, you can keep all the commandments, but if you fail in just one, you fail in all. But nobody, nobody can keep all of those commandments. We can love God. We can worship God. We cannot put any, any other God before Him. We can remember the Sabbath and keep it all. We can remember our parents. We can remember to, to be good. We can Remember all these things, but if we fail in one, we fail in all. So we can't do it that way. Jesus done for us on the cross and rising from the grave, but we never can do for ourselves. Except for Christianity, folks. All the religions of the world, they teach that there's there there's uh, that there are certain works that must do to get to heaven. So I agree. Muslims believe. They are obligated to follow the five pillars of faith. Their five pillars of faith. Mormons must get married into one of their churches' temples. They believe that. They live by that. Buddhists believe in meditation. Jehovah Witnesses share their faith door to door. And not all Protestant religions are right, and, and not all churches that come from the Catholic Church do we get a right. In effect, followers of these and other religions, they ask this question, what must I do for my situation? But the Christian, who's alive in Christ, dead to his words, and alive in Christ, asks a much different question. We ask this question, what did God do for my interest of salvation? It's all about what God did. What God did in the person of Jesus Christ. Now this idea that salvation is a gift that comes by grace through faith that we preach, that we sing, that we talk about, and not by works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. That's what we're talking about. It's, it's so radical that many religious people, they just can't accept it. They just don't think that's enough. I want to tell you folks, what Jesus did it wasn't. I know the Bible tells us that we are to be about doing good works. Jesus himself said, let them see your good works that may glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is the one who said that when people look at you and they see what you're doing, it points people to Jesus. It points people to another way. And it wasn't about what they were doing as much as what they were. The people they were they knew they were disciples of the Lord, the Bible tells us in the Gospels, by the love that they had one towards another. By their willingness to forgive errors, by their willingness to serve and to meet the needs of other people as they had opportunity. The scripture says, let us be good to you, especially to those of the household of faith, and not grow weary in you. For in due time we'll reap if we faint not. It's not about us. It's about the example that he lived before us, that we have recorded in this holy book, that we seek to live by these truths, these precepts, these concepts, these laws that are different than the laws of the Jewish race. We can sum up Christian teaching in ten words. Let me share these ten words with you. The first two, God loves. We all know John 3.16. Memorize it when we were just a little child in Sunday school. 
school classes, but God's love, it's the motivating factor in how he deals with humanity. God loved this world so much, and we know he loved it by his willingness to forgive the error of the way. That's what he did. We love him with willingness and our life to forgive. God loved me so much that he gave us one and only God. And you know what? If I was the only person that would have ever lived in this world, Jesus would have given his life for me. Because that's the word of God. So the first two words, Christian teaching is summed up in God loves. The second two words, humans sin. Humans sin. The Bible states that Adam and Eve introduced sin into the world by rebelling against not God's known will to them. Romans chapter 5 that I read, verses 12 to 18. And as a consequence, death spread to all the races because all have sinned, verse 12. And he also says the same thing in Romans 3, 23, as well as Romans 6, 23. So God loves human sin and Jesus died. Jesus came into the world to ransom the world back to God. He came into the world for one purpose, to die for the sins of the whole world. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, and in the Bible where he, you know, still get sinners, Jesus Christ died and gave himself for us. So there's six of the words. We have four to go. We can summarize this Christian teaching about living uh, by faith in God that we're being sanctified because we have been justified. We've been made right with God by what Jesus has done. And now we are living in this process of being, continually being saved. And this will go on to we in heaven with the Lord. Sanctification. Jesus died. Human sin. God's love. And the fourth, we believe. Scripture says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that, that God has raised him from the grave, we shall be saved. So we believe. We believe because that's what God did in the person of Jesus Christ. We believe. And the last two words of the 10 are God forgives. See, when we enter into a relationship with God through faith, that is the faith that we place in Him, what He has done. See, I'm not living today with my faith. I would fail all the time. I, I know what my inabilities are. I know how deceitful my heart is. But I live by the faith of the Son of God who died and gave Himself with my faith is in what he has done to make me fly so that I might be able to go on until he calls me out and I can run with him. <coughs> God forgives. When we enter this relationship with God through faith, our sins are washed away. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They shall be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. See, because of sin, I was doomed for death. The wages of sin is death. But God stepped in by sending His Son at the right time to take my place. To take my place. And now I live my life in gratitude for what He's done. And I seek to be obedient to Him. Now the Bible tells us that all the Scriptures is fulfilled in just two words, two commands. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love for God and man. Stephen goes all the way back to those four commandments in the book of Exodus chapter 20. Those first four deal with man's relationship to God. The last six deal with man's relationship to man. My relationship to mankind has a lot to say with what I'm saying I believe about my relationship. God. Though your sins be a scar, 
they shall be as white as snow. And this cleansing, folks, it comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's always been that way. When Adam and Eve sinned, God had to kill one of his animals, shed its blood, took its sins to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve couldn't take care of themselves by sewing fig leaves together and cover themselves. That was not satisfactory. God killed one of his own animals and covered them. The shedding of blood is the forgiveness of sin. We cannot be saved, folks, by our words. Because our words are as filthy rags. Our salvation is not like earning a paycheck. And our debt is too great for you and I to pay it off by our inner own efforts. You know, as Romans chapter 4 and 3 chapter 6 puts it, you know, God credits righteousness apart from works that you and I have. Folks, Jesus sacrifice, it allows us to enjoy the eternal benefits that we're experiencing this side of heaven because of the cross. And one day, when we are in heaven with our Lord, only because of what the Lord has done to make us one. When we stand in heaven and Satan comes and brings us a charge against us and says, hey, have you considered what he's been doing? Jesus stands up in our place and he says to God, he's been washed. You know what God says? Case was missed. Sometimes I wonder how many times in the day that God has to do that for me. But you know what? I don't rest and live my life by the things that I'm doing that are wrong, that are not right, that are not pleasing. I acknowledge my sin. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I confess what the Bible has already said, what the Spirit of God has shown me, and I will move forward with the reality of what His Word says about who He is in my life. That's the way we ought to live as Christians. While the things that we do religiously are good because they're reminders, that's what they are, they're reminders, we must never forget about the cross, what Jesus has done to make us right. That unless a person repents of his sin, unless he repents of his sin, he will never, no matter how much good he's done, he will never enter God's kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know your word is true, and you say that your truth sets us free. But we know it only sets us free, Father, as we apply it. We believe it and we apply its principles daily in our lives. The Lord, we seek to live by your truth. We want others to see Jesus in us. You tell us to contend for the faith. We pray that other people see Jesus in and through our lives and that our lives will point other people to Jesus because that's what really matters. You came to seek and to save those who were lost. You came to redeem mankind through the blood of Jesus Christ, your sacrifice, your once for all sacrifice. And because we believe we've entered into the reality of your truth and our place in heaven. Thank you for the truth of your word, Father. Thank you for setting us free today. Help us to be reminded of it 